Welcome to the Kill Count, where we llama up the kills in all our favorite llama movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Llamageddon. You heard that right, folks. First released in 2015, but filmed a couple years earlier, which is pretty fucking obvious. I mean, look at this thing. You know, I try to look at horror movies of all kinds on this channel, from the mainstream hits you're always telling me to do, to fun B-movies I want to share with my audience. Occasionally, I'll come across movies that feel basically homemade, but I think are worth having fun with. Today, that movie is Llamageddon. Look, I tried to research how and why this thing was made, but nope, couldn't find too much about it. Best I could tell is a grad student at Miami University in Ohio got a $3,000 grant and access to a real llama. With that, and a cast and crew of students, they shot a movie about a llama from space who kills a bunch of partying kids with laser eyes. The film professors weren't thrilled. Llamageddon wasn't the film that they gave me the grant money to make. When the professors watched the movie, this movie definitely put a black stain on that uh, on the on that scholarship. And who were the students who made this movie with three grand and again a real life llama? Well, they made it hard to know. It was directed by a guy named Robert Horn under a pseudonym Howie Doing. He also plays one of the uh, people. I, I won't call him characters. His pseudonym should have been Howie Can't Tell because he don't have too much of a digital presence at all. That's also the case for a lot of his cast and crew, all of whom used fake names as well. Gooch Jesco the third. What the are we doing here? And why would these fine young filmmakers try to pull the wool over the audience's eyes? I didn't use that metaphor correctly, but it's simple. This movie isn't good. Like, it's it's not good. <laughs> it's got bad acting, a dumb plot, and lots of sound problems. And it seems like the actors had to improvise without any improv skills. Report from NASA, they were tracking this and they believe it to be coming from the Orion Nebula. Well, it makes sense because it's, uh, it came through the northern quadrant and crash landed here, so I think it's a pretty good assumption. I mean, confirmed. That's what happened. <laughs> we never shot exactly what the script ha said. Llamageddon is purposefully trying to be so bad it's good, which I normally hate. I prefer my bad movies to come out of sincere effort, not knowing irony. But for whatever reason, I had a good time with Llamageddon. It's probably a blast to watch with friends, especially under certain conditions. And I've got to respect the filmmakers at least a little bit, because at the end of the day, they made a movie, one where everyone in it is super committed. They will make those dumb faces into a low wide angle lens. They don't care. I guarantee they were actually drinking and smoking on set. These kids aren't buying fake weed. <laughs> Most they can afford are a horse mask and some explosions. Well, actually a helicopter too. No, no fucking idea how they swung that. The word James. What? James, I need Zorin. Your help. Z-Man needs help. So, oh, James, thank God. I need your help. I've, I've lost my groove. Losing your groove turned you into a dog? What? No, that's unrelated. I, wait. Am I not a llama? I'm supposed to be a llama! Well, you know what? That's not what matters. James, I need you to help me get my groove back. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think I can help you out with that. With today's sponsor, Raycon. Yeah, that's right, little doggy Zorin. You already know how much I love my Raycon earbuds, and with tens of thousands of five-star reviews, I'm far from the only one. For years, they've been a part of my daily routine. I use them for research while I'm cooking, for stories while I'm lounging, and of course, for grooving pretty much all the time. Grooving, you say? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to their upcoming early Black Friday sale, you can have a new groove too, for less. The sale includes at least 20% off everything, but that goes up to 25% off fitness earbuds, 30% off impact earbuds, impact speakers and tech kits, and 50% off other select items. Ooh, I could stock up on family shopping too. For sure, little doggy dude. And Raycon has expanded into more than just grooves. They now offer Raycon home products like their faucet filter and power tech like their Magic 180 charging cable. But to be clear, I can still get a new groove, right? Anyone can get a new groove and an early start on their holiday shopping with Raycon's early Black Friday sale today. Go to buyraycon.com slash dead meat to get 20 to 50% off site wide. So just to be clear, you don't actually need help with this whole dog thing, right? Oh no, I just need to go back to my lab. Pull the lever, Fiona! Right lever! The word llama begins with two L's. Can we find two W's in this pile of llama poo? Let's find out and get to the kills. 
The movie begins once upon a llama planet with an animated intro. It's more Leprechaun Back to the Hood than Winnie the Pooh Blood and Honey. A bunch of llamas be prepared to go invade other planets, I guess, with their creepy llama xenomorph eggs and, uh, fascist leaders. They load into bison trailers with steel or aluminum wings and launch into space. One of them kills an astronaut when it blows up a shuttle with lasers. <gasps> Secret Gravity prequel? Then the llama crash lands on Earth, smack dab in the town of Tettlecard. Actually, it's Eaton, Ohio, which now has a bigger problem than being a town in Ohio. <laughs> They've got an evil llama problem now, and a title! Oh, wait, another one? Okay. Card! The llama winds up on the farm of these two, who are too scared by the incoming rain to call their neighbors about the animal? Well, at least they're honest about it. Did you call neighbors about their llama? No, I did not. These people act as well as they take off their shoes, which is to say, poorly. Didn't y'all ever watch Mr. Rogers? They go to bed, but I'm sure they'll be fine unless the llama figures out how to open doors. Son of a Spielberg. The Velasa Llama kills them with a blood splash like this were a cold open and supernatural. The killer llama spaceship gets discovered by this guy. My God. But honestly, nothing really comes out of this scene, so moving on. The funeral for the cold open couple is attended by their grandkids? Wait, hold up. These two have teenage grandchildren? and this this is their daughter? What is the age difference between these women? <laughs> the kids are staying at their grandparents' house because of a will dispute or some bullshit. <laughs> Floyd, the younger brother, is a whiny little wiener, constantly teased by his party girl older sister Mel. They see the llama when they get there, and I've gotta say, this llama rules. He was played by Louis the llama, so uh, good job, Lou! Inside the hot wait, yo, that that's a battery charging. <laughs> like, like a camera battery for production. <laughs> anyway, there's more teasing, and then they get all weird talking to the camera about Floyd peeing his bed. <laughs> Oh, honey, I'm sorry. What the fuck is with these they're all gonna laugh at you shots? And Mel's close-up doesn't even match where she is in the room! <laughs> the kids wave goodbye to their mom, who exits the movie, and completely ignore the dog back there, who is also never seen again. Instead, Mel declares it's party time and calls everyone ever in existence. Hey, Dan, it's Mel. Hey, Sheila. Hey, Trish. Sebastian. Amanda. Barney. They really like this jump cut invitation gag. Hey, Ted. Hey, Emily. Hold on, Rob's on the other line. Rob! Where's my fucking money? Okay, that one got me. What, then it just says time lapse? Is this supposed to be clerks or what, what are we doing here? The party gets going that night with a whole bunch of teenagers. They're doing all the drinking games, which is what you do with no budget movies bereft of creativity. Just ask my college films, The Foiling and or Mother Lover, neither of which I will ever upload or release. I'm, I'm sorry, they're just, they're, they're too bad. This house party has got silly faces and le random conversation snippets. Just can't believe that Pluto's not a planet anymore. It's also got more bush beer than anyone should ever have. I feel you, buddy. It's basically water. Floyd's a total dweeb at the party, and Mel conspires to get him laid to loosen him up. Her confederate is Dan, a guy who inexplicably wears a different shirt in every scene, and who likes to dance with Mel to sax music. <laughs> goes on for way too fucking long. Mel texts her friend Sarah, even though I, I'm pretty sure this other chick is also Sarah. I, I, I don't know, half these people are never named. I'm calling Mark. Who the fuck is Mark? Exactly! Mel looks at the text graphics instead of her phone to successfully distract her driving friend until she nearly hits a llama in the road. This llama fears no man, nor woman, nor car! So it Scott summers her through the windshield, setting her ablaze like a dark phoenix. She's only able to text back pain. Looks like they used real fire for the wide shot, and for the shots of Sarah, highly realistic visual effects. In fact, I have no idea how they even did that. Ah! There's a gaggle of stoners here, including Shaggy Rogers and Natasha Lee Stoney. A third one named Cody is, I think, played by editor Chet Stedman, which was the name of Gary Busey's character in Rookie of the Year. Cody goes outside to pee. Ooh, that's nice. Hey, that's my line! Kinda. He gets llama loogied right in the face, while everyone else is busy in the house getting needless close-ups and rack focuses on beer. Seriously, what what is with these shot choices, man? Only a dermatologist should be this close to teenage skin. This shit needs to stop. Yeah, agreed. Cody runs back inside, breaking the door in the process, but not breaking character, like a true professional. He tells everyone about the rojo-eyed llama, but they all just laugh at him. Well, most of them do anyway. What's this blonde chick doing? She only ever says a single word, and she's always like right there on the edge of the frame. What is your deal, lady? Who are you? Cody's stoner friends tell him it's just the weed, man. And the best way to fix it is with more weed, man. I'll pack a bowl for you. 
Uh, okay, don't really like this random fourth wall break. I feel violated, zoinks. The older teens invite Floyd to join them in the reindeer games, and by reindeer, I mean drinking, because they're playing Waterfall, slash King's Cup, slash Mushroom, slash Ring of Fire, slash any other regional variant you might want to call it. Whatever it's called, I spent way too much time playing it in high school and college. Somehow, though, this movie spends even more time playing it. It's too much for Floyd, who ends up vomiting, so he suggests they use the hot tub instead. A couple gets into a fight, so the boyfriend Rob, played by director Howie Doin himself, decides to save the drama for the Llama, which he mistakes for his favorite Mufasa killers. Never seen a wildebeest before. Never seen a wilder like this beast before. Then he gives it some weed to smoke. Wow, this really is let back to the hood. <laughs> Mr. Dewan set out to intentionally make a So Bad It's Good movie, with inspiration including Birdemic and The Room. He did so well at doing bad, Lloyd Kaufman at Troma wasn't interested. I met him, I pitched Llamageddon to him. Uh, he didn't want to oh. buy it. And neither was the creator of The Room. I met with Tommy Wiseau. Tried to sell him on the movie, um, gave him a copy, the one of the only DVDs ever made. Um, he never got back with me. The llama bites off Rob's fingers, giving us these awful action essential blood spurts. God, Tina, eat the food, not his fingers. Then the llama punches a hole through his body, sending his still beating heart into the arms of his girlfriend before he's dragged away to be killed for good. His ex doesn't stick around much longer since she's beaten senselessly within an inch of her face. <laughs> the llama finally puts her out of her misery by breaking her neck. You know, these kills were kind of intense, in, in like a dumb way, but still. Mel's boyfriend Trent arrives, played by the man himself, Gooch Jesco the third, ha <laughs> ha! Guy seems like a gooch. He's giving adopted Paul brother. He and Dan the Changing Shirt Man have a predator handshake slash muscle off. It gives us uncomfortable close-ups of their mouths, followed by close-ups of like everybody's mouths. Dear God, there are so many mouths and tongues, ugh! We get more tongues thanks to some dueling sex scenes, but don't worry, they're PG-13. Mel and Trent get it on in the bathroom as a crew member watches from the background. Jesus, creeper jump scare in that mirror. Meanwhile, Floyd is taken into a bedroom by the second Sarah and just everyone waggles their tongues everywhere as more sax music plays. Man, maybe you guys shouldn't have shot in a room with a giant mirror. Just as Mel had hoped for, the sexual experience is transformative for Floyd. I'm a man now. All right, bud, quit corpsing. You're at like a quarter Fallon with that smile there. The obviously not turned on jacuzzi is used by some obviously not turned on people. They include at least one dude we've never seen before. Two if Horsehead's also a newbie. Ah, he's saying nay to Bush Beer. Good for him. The llama wants to join in on the fun, so this actual real life llama winds up in the room with them. Oh, blonde lady looks so concerned about that thing. The llama is not cuidado and kills the boozy jacuzziers by tossing a radio into the water. It shocks all five of them to death, although some of the actors commit more than the others. Come on, blondie! Cody walks in and sees the evil llama again, so he flees the film entirely. Dude never shows up again. Guess he had to go start that edit. Two more idiots, Sam and Stacy, show up, and despite the literal flashing warning sign and the convulsing of their friends, dip their toes into the electric soup, getting them added to the count as well. Should have listened for the soft chime. Dan finds all the dead bodies and interrupts an arguing Mel and Trent to tell them the devastating news. Everyone is dead in the hot tub. Dude really can't get over it. Everyone is dead in the hot tub! Oh, don't you go fallin' on me too, dude. This ain't no Debbie Downer sketch. Since this is movie land, their phones can't get signal enough to call the cops. My parents don't make eight figures for fucking two out of six bars, Jesus. With no phones, some lights, and a llama by their motor cars, they're forced to run and flee. But unfortunately for these beer pong champs, it results in fatalities. <laughs> Holy shit, that was amazing! And followed by a stupid amount of blood sprays from like every angle but the right one. <laughs> These blood squirts look like they're from a squeeze bottle or something. Oh wait, that's actually exactly how they did it. They used a giant fucking squirt gun. The same death gag is repeated for the other guy who ran and they're gonna keep doing that throughout the film. The llama, still standing like right there I guess, spits up a bunch of green goop that covers Trent and probably gets in his mouth. Fucking gross. It immediately begins to transform him with all the technical sophistication of an American werewolf wolf in London. Just really, the greatest effects you'll ever see here, folks. The kids remember that landlines are a thing, and when the cops won't listen, they call their dad, who's shown to be banging a sex worker, I think? This was revealed earlier with the movie's trademark stupid close-ups. The llamified Trent enters the house, his condition shocking everyone, including himself. What is happening to me? Then this one chick wakes up. I don't know who the fuck she is, but at least this nap was established earlier. Yeah, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll take that now. That pretty tired had huge I'm so pale energy. Yeah, I'm pretty tired. I'm so pale. 
When she steps outside, she goes from pretty tired to pretty dead, since the llama kills her via various Hawaiian punch splashes against the front door. Now we're in the worst part of any slasher, where the survivors run from the killer through underexposed shots in the wood. Oh wait, hey, that dog is back! <laughs> oh, that good boy looks like he's having lots of fun. Yo, but wait, did they really knock down a tree for this shit? What? <laughs> Anyways, Sarah trips while running, as you do, and gets killed by the llama's usual method of laser beam and blood spray. Jump break, kid. Dan and Floyd tell Llama Trent he's not allowed to hang out with them anymore, so they leave him behind to really struggle with that red eye effect. Fix your tracking keyframes, guys! I'm the fucking Llama Man! Not quite yet, Trent! The rest of your transformation will have to happen in another new groundsy animation. I guess they couldn't afford practical Llama tummy tentacles. Must have spent all their money on that really important helicopter scene. <laughs> My god. The kids find the Llama's ride, and since Floyd is a man now, he correctly identifies it. It has wings like a space Ship. It's red like a spaceship. Great deduction skills there, Floyd. Oh, and what'd you just find there, Dan? Is that a goddamn space stick? It's a goddamn space stick. I thought so. Well, that or a wiffle ball bat wrapped in tin foil. Y you know, it's, it's one of two. Dan briefly uses the space stick to repel the llama's attacks. But after an explosion and a noble speech, Dan is also killed via llama laser and blood spray. Y y you get the picture by now with these kills, right? Floyd and Mel are unsuccessfully hiding in the hayloft of the barn when their dad arrives because of their phone call. And daddy's got a gun. Not positive he's properly trained to use it, but he sure got one. He's got a gun and an appetite for space slime. Mm. The movie's most drawn out scene unfolds as Trent screams and gives birth to several llama space eggs. It takes forever and is unpleasant in terms of both sight and sound. <laughs> Wow, that guy's going full gooch for the scene. Finally, Daddy arrives and agrees to put Trent out of his misery with a single shot to the head. Yo, his eyes didn't have the red glow for a second. That was close to a kid murder, dude. Pop sees a bunch of corrupted Kriyas and plays whack a Cusco with a shotgun. It's as easy as shooting llamas in a barn, which is not a phrase. Then he runs into the big llama and gets into a fight with that thing too. Okay, I, I don't know anything about guns, but that cannot be proper shooting technique. The llama dissolves the gun with its laser and beats the crap out of Dad with its hooves, then puts the guy down by taking a bite out of his neck. A big old chunk, look at that! Damn, he's not gonna be able to see his daughter Mel find some respect for her little brother Floyd. You're always just this little boy to me, but now after all of this, after everything that's happened, I really am beginning to see you as a man. A little man, but a man. A Marion! The llama tries to interrupt this sweet moment with more death, but what's left of Dad is able to turn on a combine that pulls the llama in to squish it to death. Just a full llama guts a rama all up on the side there. But it's not humanoid, so it doesn't go on the kill count. Sorry, llama. Dad doesn't have much time left, but does tell his kids how to kill future space llamas. Like most living things, you run them through a combine and pretty much take care of it. With those parting words of wisdom, the dad dies from his llama hickey, and they maybe watch his soul go up to heaven, or they're just looking out for more space llamas. The movie ends with a third title card! God, that's where the budget went. The entire movie is played in sped up motion over the credits filled with fake names. An original song also recaps the movie for you, including all its finer plot points. And take a shot. Then take another shot, then another, another shot, then another, another, another Bob. shot. Actually, I, I don't hate this song. How many people survived their extreme close up encounters with a space traveling camelid? Let's find out and hey, get to the number. Hey, James, just wanted to let you know I'm heading out, so make sure to keep an eye on Zorin and be sure he doesn't wet the bed while I'm gone. But Chelsea, you said you wouldn't tell anyone. Oh, Zorin, I'm sorry. Sorry. It's just that sometimes you get too excited when you think you might get to do a kill count for the movie Freaked. <laughs> yeah, that's not happening anytime soon. No one knows that movie. Fine, it's still not fair. Dude, just, just pick a normal movie. Okay, what about uh, Night of the Creeps? Isn't that just Slither? Y yes, but don't tell James Gunn that. I counted 20 kills in Llamageddon, even though I didn't know half these people's fucking names. The victims included 9 women and 11 men, giving us a nearly even pie chart that we've actually never seen on this show before, so good job Llamageddon! I guess. With a runtime of 69 minutes, which, yes, was intentional, we had a kill on average every 3.45 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to the partygoer who ran for it, only to be exploded into a fireball. <laughs>
The shit was hilarious. And the blood sprays were funny until they became overused. Double machete for lamest kill will go to Sam and Stacy, who got into an electrified hot tub without even an ounce of rationale behind it. And that's it. Llamageddon came out in 2015 on Amazon, which initially listed its digital price at $1 million for standard def, $1 million and 99 cents for HD. The price came down after a few days, with the publicity stunt successfully earning the movie some attention. Then this year, in 2023, an Indiegogo was launched to fund a sequel called Alpocalypse, which came with a teaser trailer. They hoped to raise $1 million, but only got about $2,500 before shutting down the campaign. Possibly due to controversy, since director Howie Doohan tried to make the movie without the original team or his co-creators. So much llama drama. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count on Llamageddon. I hope you guys had as much fun watching it as I did making this thing. I absolutely love the in-depth Kill Counts that really get into how a movie is made and explore all the cultural contexts and go deep dives into like what it means and everything. But also sometimes I like to just watch a shitty movie and make jokes about it. I said this in a lot of live streams and stuff leading up to this episode, but this really reminded me of Thanksgiving. Definitely not as crass, but uh, obviously just as homemade. It's a fucking student film. So hopefully anyone who feels nostalgic about the earlier episodes of Dead Meat really enjoyed this one. I did. It was a fucking blast, dude. Also, I hope you've been catching my weekly Monday morning live streams. They happen at 9 a.m. Pacific, so 12 noon Eastern. And in them, I go over news about horror stuff, whether it's movies or games or whatever. Anyway, definitely tune into those live streams because I also let you know what's coming up on the channel. Future kill counts, future other series, what the podcast is doing. And also, it's just a fun way to connect with my audience again. I miss doing live streams like I used to at the start of the channel. Hope you're all having a good end of your year right now. Thanks everyone. Be good people.